how much of science progresses by individual lone geniuses and how much by the messy collaboration of competing and um, cooperating humans. I don't think you can cut that with a knife to say it's this percent and that percent. It's almost always the case that there are one or two or maybe three individuals who are sort of central to what goes on when things begin to shift. Are they inevitably and solely responsible for what then begins to happen um, in a major way? I think not. Uh, it depends. You can go f very far back with this, uh, <clears throat> even into antiquity, to see what goes on. Um, the locus, the major locus we always talk about from the beginning is if you're talking about Galileo's work on motion, for example, uh, were there ways of accommodating it that others could adapt to without buying into the whole scheme? Yes. Um, did it eventually evolve and start convincing people because you could also do other things with it that you couldn't otherwise do? Also, yes. Let me give you an example. The great French mathematician philosopher Descartes, who uh, was a mechanical philosopher, he believed the world was matter in motion, he never thought much of what Galileo had done in respect to motion because he thought, well, at best, it's some sort of approximative scheme or something like that. But one of his uh, initial, uh, I wouldn't call him a disciple, but follower, who then broke with him in a number of ways, was a man named Christian Huygens, who was, along with Newton, one of the two greatest scientists of the 17th century. Huygens is older than Newton. And Huygens nicely deployed Galilean relationships in respect to motion to develop all sorts of things, including the first pendulum-governed clock, <clears throat> and even figured out how to build one which is keeps perfect time, except it didn't work, but he had the mathematical structure for it. 